Good morning, welcome back to the 120th. This weekend just gone, I was in Worcester for the inaugural Analog Spotlight event. Now, if you're in the US uh, or elsewhere in the world, don't switch off because the topics that we talked about and the topics that were covered there are absolutely global ones. They are relevant to everything that we do in film photography throughout the world. Things like innovation in film photography, film supply chain issues, uh, camera repair and maintenance, uh, how to make film photography more eco-friendly, bringing more people into film photography. None of these subjects are UK only, they're all topics that are being talked about worldwide. So I hope you'll find this inspiring and interesting wherever you are in the world. All right, let's go and talk to Hamish Gill, uh, one of the founders of Analog Spotlight and one of the organizers of this event. And I'm talking to Hamish Gill, famous for the 35MMC blog, but also um, you are instrumental in the Analog Spotlight. Yes, so the backstory is, a few years ago, I spoke to the guys that, that run TPS, a uh, photography show at the NEC. I rang them and I essentially said, there's not enough analogue stuff here. And they said, yes, we know. Um, what do you think we should do? And I said, well, I think we should have an analogue zone. And maybe we could have like little pods on the zone for small, in the analogue world, there's a lot of very small businesses. Then last year, the end of last year, we had the first analogue spotlight stand or uh, zone at the photography show loads of people said you should do this as a standalone thing and me and Paul were like hmm, we should do this as a standalone thing <laughs> so yeah I spoke to Matt from Ilford he was like yep yeah, do it We've, we all saw how successful that one over in the States the Padea or whatever it was over in the States a few years ago was so we went out to the analog world did a survey and said you know what do you want essentially the thing that people came back with was possibly because we were still coming through COVID at the time was more real life events yeah. so we're like right okay that seals it we'll do this uh, now hamish does have products that he's selling namely pixelator and omnar lenses i'll come back to those later in the video first let's go and talk to paul mckay one of the founders of analog wonderland and another organizer of this event uh, i found paul from analog wonderland hi, paul. hello hello uh, how's it been going today you've been busy oh yeah it has been busy um which has been obviously really lovely. <laughs> Are you seeing is business booming? Is it going up? Is it going down? What's the yeah. tell, tell me about the analog world in the UK at the minute? <laughs> it's it's good. I mean, it's hard for us to know the bigger picture because when we're so new, you'd like to think it'd be sure. e you easier to grow than. You have got thirty years exactly of, of, of numbers to work by. No, no, no. So we're still learning so much as we go. Yeah. Um, the tough thing at the moment is obviously colour film, thirty-five mil. Well, yeah. It's been a tough old couple of years for everyone and anyone who has a global supply chain and in fairness like Kodak Colour Film is the most obvious but um, you know we had a situation where Ilford couldn't get HP5 the other day and you're just like what yeah and then it turns out it's because of cardboard and Brexit uh, um, a lot of things so a load of stuff's going on yeah anyone with a global supply chain has had a tough couple of years um, but the good news is Kodak are investing as a company they are massively um, emotionally invested as well into fixing this um, so I have that is good, isn't it? I mean, because because Fuji bailed out, no. So and what's the exact? They ceased production of all their color films. Is that right? Nothing or official. Going to? Nothing. Nothing official. Oh really? Nothing official. So oh, you, right. you hear so different things at different times. No, yeah. no, no. It's fine because um, the way Fuji film tend to let the world know things is by uh, press. Not even press release. Often, often it's investor statements in Japanese yeah. that then trickle through um, to to us yeah. but it, because of that it's very it's often very vague and it's couched in terms of like business strategy and yeah, yeah, manufacturing yeah, yeah. arms so we're not really sure i mean we i spoke to a fuji guy a couple of months ago who was adamant that they were still making it they had to pause for covid oh, right. then you see rumors elsewhere so you're still able to buy fuji film in fact you've got some i think you've got some pro 400 h discounted at the moment haven't you? pro 400 h discount and we've got some of the new 200 stuff but it's okay. come We've had to source it from Asia via, uh, from America via Asia. So it's super expensive, but it's the only way we can get it. So all of these things are just becoming very different, very expensive. But you're right, you then say, and, and Kodak's a great example, but also you talk to Lomography, you talk to um, the, the people behind Fomapan, you talk to Sinistil, you talk to all these people, Ilford obviously, all these people are so invested financially and emotionally in making it work. So that's news to me. I thought Fuji had confirmed they were they were stopping film production, but apparently not confirmed. So that's exciting. There is hope for my Fuji Pro 400H yet. You started the um, uh, developing and printing. Yes, are going well. Busy. It's very busy. It's um, it's been a lesson in the joys of 1990s technology. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I love it. The uh, our scanner 
has software that comes with it that has to run on Windows 2000. Right. So we had to find a computer that could run Windows 2000. Yeah. Um, and the little icon for uh, saving scans is a little man running with a floppy disk and putting it in a box. I love it. I love it. You Brilliant. Like, do you feel like film photography is coming back strong enough for it to uh, for there to be a real real strong market again? But for, so, for example, I know that there's innovation on the small scale with cameras and Chroma and, and, and the Intrepid and all the rest of it. But as a, uh, to, for it to be a big industry again, is it strong enough? Is yeah. Resurgence? Definitely. You can see the numbers of, and the interest in people that go along. And you see the industries that can survive on fewer people. I think the other thing that's really interesting is how much of the innovation is driven by digital technologies helping make things cheaper. Right. And again, like Pixelator, who's over there, falls into the same thing where you're going, what you can now do on a budget, both manufacturing but also as a photographer, is really enabled by digital stuff. Now there are camera repair people who 3D print new parts that haven't been able to fix cameras for 30 years because those parts just don't exist. So as that kind of thing carries on, you'd expect that to be. And also, yeah, you see, you know, as I say, Ilford is run by business people. Uh, Kodak is run by business people. They're not daft. And if there was no money in it, they wouldn't waste their time, sadly. They're not doing it for the good of their hearts and charity. So oh, they're not? No. Maybe, maybe yeah. someone is, in which case, pray to God they continue in that role. Uh, yeah, that is why I do. I do not make money. But <laughs> <laughs> personal, personal issues aside, yeah. um, the, um, you got to think that that's, they know more than I do about sure. that. Uh, there were quite a few new products being showcased at the Analog Spotlight event. Um, one of possibly the newest, uh, it's not launched yet, it's not even on Kickstarter yet. Uh, was the Titch from Alfie Cameras. Uh, right, I've just come across Dave from Alfie Cameras. Uh, I was just saying to him that I've heard of Alfie Cameras, but I don't really know what they do. So, Dave. Alfie Cameras, we're, we're developing a new 35mm half-frame film camera. Uh, we're intending to launch in the summer this year, and we're here at the Analog Spotlight Gathering, gathering people's views and opinions on our prototypes so that we can help decide key things like what other lenses they'd like to see on a creative multi-lens camera. So this is prototype number two. It's not a manual thing, it's not a, uh, a mechanical camera. There, is there are mechanical elements but it's got electronics in it. So this is, this is the board that's in there, a USB charger. Okay, yep. So you can charge it up. At the moment, my firmware is just manual mode. Okay. And you can change your shutter speed yeah. up and down and then fire off the shutter. Ultimately, yeah. there'll be an automatic mode for, um, for the different lenses. Light sensor, light meter in here. And, um, and you'll have point and shoot with, with um, plus or minus compensation if you want it. So what will, this, what will the computer control? Is that going to control the computer's the controlling the shutter. Okay. So we've got a f125 pinhole lens, which okay. is obviously focus anywhere. Everything and nothing. Everything yeah. and nothing. <laughs> um, and uh, an f8 disposable camera lens at the moment. Okay. That is, um, it's about 1.2 meters to infinity. Right. I actually really like this. It feels kind of modern, like a real hybrid camera, a real combination of old and new. Uh, shooting half frame on 35mm, uh, fixed aperture, focus free, but a digitally controlled shutter giving you manual and auto options. So Alfie Cameras, as a company, we want to encourage people to connect with the, the idea of taking pictures and connect with an object and with the process of what they're doing okay. and not be obsessed with their screen, chimping yeah. away, yeah. but you're out there doing something that engages you with the world yeah. and, and gets you away from screens. And gets you back into the film. And gets you back into film, yeah. So this is fascinating actually. It does feel like something, almost like a, um, a camera for, the, for a modern age. It's more of a hybrid, right? Yeah, I think yeah. It's, it's a creative tool that I hope it appeals to to a new generation of, of film photographers who want something fun that they can do creative stuff with. We're about um, two to three months from launching on Kickstarter. There'll be some great offers on those Kickstarter early, early backers. And then we'll be into full production later in the year um, and definitely selling direct, possibly selling um, through outlets like Analog Wonderland, you never know. Yeah. Uh, where can we find you on social media? On social media, we're at Alfie Cameras, um, both on Instagram mainly, but Facebook, Twitter, and eventually TikTok, once I get my hand, head around that one. <laughs> really? You're going to try TikTok? I am going to give it a go. Dude, mate, you know, you've got a big task ahead of you, but I am um, I'm impressed. 
Yeah. Looks great. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing it on Kickstarter. So am I. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Next up, more new cameras hitting the market from the amazing Chroma cameras. Explain what you do, Steve. Okay, I design and build um, 3D printed cameras with a whole range of formats, 35 mil, 120 and large format. Now, there's one camera in your lineup that has been, uh, is, it, is it, no, that's not the carbon one, is it the Chroma Carbon Adventure, this one, here we go. The Carbon Adventure is my kind of top field camera. So my, my original camera was a, sim, a simpler 4x5. Um, so this does everything, basically there's full manual control on uh, rise, tilt, shift. So you've got all nice smooth movements, independent. They're also magnetic zeros, so it all goes back to zero. I designed it with interchangeable rear body. So standard camera is 4x5, but I also have a 5x7 rear body and I'm working on a 617. The carbon kind of does is my do everything camera. I think I've got the snapshot, which is the handheld version weighs 600 grams and so you can walk around with it and it's got a helicoid for focusing. That's 265 for the standard one. That's not bad is it? We've, I've, I've talked to you about these too, these yeah. are both medium format stuff as well but I'm actually quite interested in this. Yeah. So do tell. This is my new Cube 6.6, 6. so this is the new medium format pinhole camera. So this is a, a 0.2 millimeter pinhole on a 6x6 frame. So this gives you a nice wide angle view. The, the frame guides on the top and also on the sides of the body, show you composition on here. So that gives you your field of view. Yeah, so yeah, as yeah. you're looking from the side, you know what's going to be in frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the smaller, the baby cube's got that as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, this that's, is the, that's the 35 that's mil the one, yeah? 35 mil cube, yeah. yeah. It's brand new today. These are literally the first ones I've made, so. Have you got one to, that you can sell today? Yeah, these are all for sale. I may well yeah. have to take one off your hands. So these are 120 pounds, yeah. the baby one is 60. And when are they going to be on the website? Um, tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So, what well, tonight if I get home in time. What is the website, Steve? It's chroma.camera. Chroma.camera. Um, I'm going to uh, put the camera down now and buy one of these. Because <laughs> I want one. Uh, and here is my Cube 6.6. Uh, not on sale on his website at that stage. It is now. Um, and I think this was the first one bought from him on the day, on Saturday. So this could actually be the very first Chroma Cube 6.6 to be released into the world. How exciting is that? Unless you're my wife, of course, in which case, what, this? No, I've had this for ages. You've seen this before. <laughs> anyway, brand new product. Um, that'll be the next video on the channel, so watch out for that. Uh, one big thing that was really apparent at this event was collaboration and the fact that people are all working together, sharing ideas, sharing knowledge. One example of that amazing collaboration was I didn't find out until after I purchased this, this Cube 6.6 from Steve that a lot of the parts were actually 3D printed by Simon Forster of Forster Photographic, who is uh, currently making some custom lens boards for me so that I can fit my Dalmire lenses to my speed graphics. Let's go and see him next. Uh, I have found Simon from uh, Simon Forster Photographic. Uh, he of the orange lens caps. Pro, pro orange. Pro orange lens yeah. caps, there we go. And indeed the orange cameras. You were just telling me that you actually, you printed these bits yourself, is that yeah, right? Yeah, that, that's right. Um, so I do a lot of work with uh, Steve Lloyd of Chroma Camera. Yeah. I, I never know whether to be looking at that or whether to be looking at Wherever you want. Yeah. Okay. Whatever, whatever makes you happy. <laughs> well, it's YouTube, no one gives a shit. Okay, yeah, <laughs> no, nobody's watching anyway. It's a, bit like, yeah, exactly. it's a bit like my podcast. I work with Steve Lloyd of Chroma Cameras um, yeah. and uh, I wanted one of his cameras. And I'm not um, surprised. so I thought, well, I'll print, I'll print my bits, and I'll print yeah. my bits in pro orange, and um, and this is, yeah, this is the camera that uh, it is, it is pretty, it is pretty. And it's also got Simon. We uh, we all know why I'm here. Yes. Well, I'm here to see you. Yes. How did you get on? Very well. Yeah. You, you gave me, a, you gave me a challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And. Um, <laughs> It, it was it was more work than I expected. Um, That's, but that it was, seems to be everything that I do with cameras is more yeah, work than I expected. Yeah. yeah, we've got the two Dalmayas, and they're absolutely beautiful lenses. Odd size lens, odd size thread lens. So these are old um, imperial uh, thread sized lenses. Yeah. You were more keen on this one though, right? The, yeah. um, the the eight and a half inch. That's that's right. I, I don't know what the lens formulation is on this, but when you actually look at, look through this and look at on the ground glass and look at people through it, it's yeah. absolutely beautiful. I think, it, yeah, see I found that, I was just telling you the, the, the story that I um, knew nothing about what I was buying when I bought that. Um, 
was looking around. I'd heard the name Dalmire. I'd, I'd read some stuff about it. Looked for a Dalmire lens. That came up on eBay. I think it was eighty quid that I picked up for. That's a steal. Yeah, absolute steal. Um, I'll give you ninety pounds today for this. <laughs> yeah. And here they are, my wonderful Dalmire lenses on custom uh, boards for the Speed Graphic with um, the lens caps in pro orange. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, getting out and giving these a run on the Speed Graphic that video coming along soon as well. Okay, let's move on now to another familiar face, James Lane from Zone Imaging. Uh, look who I found. Hello. <laughs> James Lane, who has obviously been on the channel before and you're here plugging your pyro. Not just well, five-time pyro, I've got other developers as well here. Sample developer of the next one I'm releasing. Okay. So uh, I'm not telling a name yet. Still. That's, yeah, yeah. Um, when I release it, I'll tell you a name. It's like two developers in one, yeah. for the, depending which dilution you're using. You get a completely different look. So it's used 1 to 200 or 1 to 500. So with a weaker dilution, it's, it's where it gets very interesting. You get compression of mid-tones, quite high contrast, but controlled highlights at the same time. But you get an etching look. Oh, OK. It's like an etching. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, you, when you use 1 to 200, it's closer to a, a, well, like a normal developer. Third developer I'm hoping to release much later on. That's in negotiations with Ilford. Hopefully they say yes. So this is going to be the most eco and most user safe developer ever to be made. And the HP5 is grainless. And I got proof here on my laptop. Oh, uh, can you show me? Yeah, I'm not sure if you can see it on the camera though. Let's try it. Very sharp, you can see. Yeah, and that's 35 mil? Yeah, 35 mil. Wow. They're all eco, but that's even more eco. Um, it's, it's a big thing now, isn't it? Film photography is not the most eco-friendly no, thing. it doesn't. Yeah. No. All right, well, there's a lot of exciting stuff yeah. coming up from you, James. Yeah, Thank you very much for talking to me. I'm going to carry on my yeah. way around. Actually, before I go, please may I buy another bottle of Yes, I got a bottle. Making film photography more eco-friendly is a topic that came up over and over again. Um, I think we're all very conscious that film photography is not particularly uh, good for the environment. You know, plastic films, um, chemicals, and all the rest of it. Of course, film photography grew up in an era when priorities were very different. The good news is that this is an area where I was hearing a lot about innovation, new ideas, new approaches, new ways of doing things that will hopefully reduce the impact of film photography on the environment. So that's encouraging. You know, change is happening, which brings me on to lens fair let's talk to them next all right now we are now talking to dan from lens fair so we're a uh, vintage camera store uh, we launched in 2020 at the beginning of lockdown we actually ended up launching the store a week after the country went into lockdown and we thought it was the biggest mistake that we'd ever made um, but it actually turned out to be really beneficial for us and we had a lot of people that were um, kind of being furloughed and coming back to kind of doing hobbies that they might not have been able to do while they were working so we were going from strength to strength um, to the point in 2021 we decided to launch our own camera so we spent most of 2021 developing our uh, snap camera which is uh, that's your own camera that's our own camera yes oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. we wanted to be kind of seen as a more sustainable brand yeah. we've obviously refurbishing cameras and kind of saving cameras from landfill we thought well we could do something with reusable cameras that kind of made it a little bit more uh, eco-friendly yeah. The replaceable stickers are biodegradable, all of the packaging is either recyclable or biodegradable. The camera itself is made from ABS plastic, which is widely recyclable. Um, we plant a tree for every camera that we manufacture. We plant another tree for every camera that we sell. There are ways that we can, we can all kind of do our little bit to kind of improve um, it on that front. And, and this, is kind of, this is our way of, of doing that. Um, also partnered up with, um, with charities that um, uh, one specific charity that works with uh, disadvantaged youth um, to provide cameras for, for them, uh, like children uh, from ages 5 to 15, to get them into the creative arts um, in, kind of, uh, in situations where they probably wouldn't normally be able to experience um, yeah, analog yeah, photography. It bit, so, yeah, it's, it's not easy to, it's not cheap to get at. So here is Alicia. We, uh, we, <laughs> <laughs> the idea is to provide the cameras to them um, potentially with custom custom skins um, for for children, yeah, for children to kind of learn the basics of analog photography in, in a really accessible way. Uh, are they any good? 
Yeah, they, they actually are really good. They you are. can go on their Instagram and you'll see like, lots of example photos, a lot yeah. of tag designs, some that we've taken ourselves. Have a look. Yeah, of course. Like, so, you know, it's like, it is what it is. It's, it's a beginner entry level camera, but yeah. we do think it's quite versatile. It's got a wide enough lens, a low enough aperture for, you know, someone that just wants something to, to yeah. shoot on. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's like a, it's the perfect sort of, you know, segue into photography, may into I film ask, photography. Yeah, may I ask how much they cost? They're £35. It's a bargain, really, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. I don't know if I would choose this this covering myself. But yeah. We also nice. retail it yeah. through Analog Wonderland, and they have yeah. they have their oh, own one with yeah, yeah, an Analog exactly. Wonderland skin. Yeah, and yeah there's really. on the table over there. Actually. Yeah, it's just there. So, yeah. I've, I've already filmed that, so I have a close up of that already, yeah, yeah. but I, I did so not connect that. the two. Yeah. The, the trip 35s really do look good, don't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah they're the best uh, models. Really. Well, lovely to talk to you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, uh, yeah, Alicia, who showed up halfway through that, uh, runs Lens Fair with Dan, but is also one of the organisers of Analog Spotlight. So thank you, Alicia, for all your hard work. Um, sticking with the subject of eco-friendliness within film photography, one thing that we already do that does make film photography a bit more eco-friendly uh, is maintaining and repairing old cameras so that it's not just a question of binning old cameras and, and, and building new ones. Um, digital photography, once you've got a camera in your hand, is very eco-friendly. There's not much damage being done to the environment with you just clicking away firing the shutter 2,000 times. However, the impact to the environment of building that digital camera is significant. So within the film photography industry, maintaining, repairing, and keeping old cameras going is actually doing a fair bit. And leading the charge uh, of keeping old cameras running in the UK is Piero Pozzella. Yeah, so I originally started off repairing, um, which is what everyone knows me for. Got my name in the industry for repairing compacts, uh, which most people don't touch nowadays. I still repair. Um, but we started to expand, so we now do custom repaints, and we build custom parts, and we've just started to dabble in lens conversions as well. So uh, if you saw the AE1 program uh, video that I did a long time ago, and my camera was making a horrible noise, Piero was the one that fixed it. Uh, and he says he remembers it vividly. Yeah, vividly, yeah. I do get a lot of Canon A ones with squeaks coming in. But, um, I bet you do. Um, I do have one uh, deep question that I've been dying to ask you. Are you, are you, have you got, are you even slightly bored of repairing cameras yet? No, you're joking. It's only, I'm only starting to learn now, 10 years into it, and I've been learning more than ever. You just don't stop learning every bit of engineering because the more time goes on, the more new faults keep popping up, and you think, how on earth has that happened? And it's just, I love the problem solving of it. And you still are spending as much time sitting there at your desk? More time. So uh, when I was, did start doing this, it funded my BA and my master's, and now I do it full time. So I'm at that desk 24-7, repairing constantly. The, the last communication that Piero and I had was I emailed him asking him uh, whether he would do a service and a repair on a Pentacon 6 and he said no and I would like to know. tell me why the reason is I'm running out of parts in all honesty and that's what's causing a lot of some repairs I can't take on so what I do is pass them on to another repairer who has the parts so it's a little community but don't be don't worry I am making my own parts now and not just replicating but we're re-innovating so that they don't fail in the same way okay. so I will soon be able to take on more and more the job that you did on the AE1 was amazing and um, I had had that camera for 27 years and I sent it to you and it came back just feeling like a new camera again. There you go, so, last another 27 years for me. Yeah, Fingers yeah, crossed. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Not that I want to put you out of business or anything, <laughs> no. but you know, yeah. Uh, website? www.pppcameras.co.uk All right, cool. Uh, so there we go, yeah, Piero, PPP Repairs. Uh, cool, thank you, Piero. Thank you very much, mate. Piero has been repairing cameras for, I think, about 10 years now, and he has a thriving business, PPP Cameras. Um, I have so much respect for what he does. Uh, as we know, repairing cameras is possibly the most infuriating thing in the world. Uh, and he does it all day, every day. So um, good for you, buddy. Uh, long may it last. Uh, the next clip that you're going to see, I need to make an apology for. So I went down to see Intrepid Cameras. Um, uh, and my audio recorder failed. I think the battery ran out. My bad. So despite the wonderful Naomi from Intrepid Cameras wearing my uh, radio mic like a pendant, the audio is bloody awful. But I think you can hear her. Uh, right, I found Intrepid Cameras and Naomi who is going to talk to me. Uh, so Naomi, tell me what's new with Intrepid. As you know, we make uh, affordable, lightweight 4x5, 5x7 and 8x10 large format cameras. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest thing uh, since last year is we now make uh, enlargers. So, but again, um, they're super compact, super lightweight. 
um, and really affordable. So it means that instead of having to have like a really big, bulky, older, larger, you can have something like this, which is really tiny um, and you can, it's so small you can pack it away into like a drawer or something after you've used it. I've got a confession to make here actually. Yeah. I actually do own your 4x5 and larger. So the confession I have to make is it's still in the box. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, I was just telling your colleague that I'm uh, in the process of trying to light proof my garage yeah. so I can actually get things up and running. But this is very interesting. Tell me about that one. It was a big step for us really and super exciting to be able to um, branch out from just doing products for large water photographers but also yeah. create something that's for people that shoot 35mm 120 because obviously that is a much bigger part of the film shooting world. Um, and unlike the 4 so the 4x5 and larger obviously converts to 4x5 camera but the compact and larger is an all-in-one unit, so um, yeah, it will do 35 mil and it will do 124 that's up to six by nine. And unlike the first model, it does colour as well as well as black and white. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think is fantastic is that you've got new companies making yeah. new stuff for yeah. film. It's not just a question of re, you know, churning over the old stuff and trying to repair yeah. what was. But the, as you said before, like the, the key thing is modern companies coming up with new ways. Um, of utilising like modern technology yeah. to create products for film, yeah, and that's yeah. the only way that films get to growing and keep doing well, really. Definitely, I agree. I love what you're doing, and uh, I love my Intrepid camera. Um, uh, thanks very much for talking to me. There you are. Uh, that new compact enlarger, though, right? Looks amazing. Uh, I suspect I will own one of those at some point in the future. Um, I need a darkroom first, though, so I think it may be a little premature to be hitting the Intrepid website just yet. Uh, does 35 mil though and 120 up to six by nine um, and has an LED panel, the light source. You can change the color of the LEDs, which means that you don't need contrast filters anymore. How about that? Amazing. Right, let's head back to Hamish Gill and hear about some of his products that we didn't talk about earlier. Um, I think we've all mostly heard about Pixelator, which are scanning masks that, that help you uh, scan, DSLR scan your negatives on a, a light panel. I'll put the website here so that uh, you can go and find out a bit more about that. What I really want to talk to Hamish about was his Omnar lenses, which I know a lot less about. I've heard of 35 MNC, I've heard of you, I've heard of Pixelator, have not heard of Omnar. Omnar lenses. So these, so this is a collaboration with uh, Chris Andreo, who runs Skillaney, Opto Mechanics up in Scotland. A lens called a uh, out of a, ca a camera called the Canon AF10, which is a yes. little point and shoot yeah, yeah, yeah. camera. Yep. Uh, Twenty pounds worth of camera, surrounded by uh, nearly a thousand pounds worth of brass and uh, very high-end mechanics. It's it's uh, machined to five microns. Um, wow whatever is tolerant so it's like super smooth and lovely and would it be um would it be wrong of me to say why um no <laughs> because this is con connoisseur yeah. do you know what i mean lens level you know i mean it's these is, i mean feel feel how smooth you hold them tight yeah wow yeah that is um it does feel like quality doesn't it so zach snyder in that recent zombie film yeah so yeah. that was shot on rehoused for Zach, a 50mm or a series of 50mm 0 0.95 Canon lenses yeah. and a series of 35mm 1.5 Canon lenses. Yeah. Those lenses were chosen for that film because that's the look that Zach wanted in that film. So everything's shot wide open. If you yeah. watch it, everything really ultra, ultra, ultra narrow ultra depth short of field. Depth of field yeah. That's the look that he wanted in that film. Right. Soft, slightly smoogy out of focus areas. Yeah. In the world of photography, Everybody goes for the sharpest, the best, you know, it's what's the latest Sony G series, whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. it is, fancy, you know, 15 elements in 12 groups, whatever. Yeah, yeah. In, and the same as in cinema, where you can get a really nice lens and have it really, really expensively rehoused yeah. into a cinema lens, yeah. what's the equivalent in photography? Well, there that's isn't us. one currently, but that's, so that's, that's what that is. That's what we're doing. And, so we're taking was lenses this? that people want they, want, they know what they want, they know the character of a lens. Mm -hmm. They know what they want, and they want it rehoused in something that feels awesome to use. The results, so even the people who've bought the lens, yeah. i.e. put faith into it, yeah. have emailed me since with, they'll send me like 100% crops. Yeah. Like, look how sharp it is. I'm really? like, yeah, I know, I, ch I chose it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I chose it because it's this good. That's amazing. And they, and they you know, people can't believe how good it is yeah, because yeah, it yeah. comes in a 25, 30 quid, basically piece of crap camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually a really good F6 lens. So there we go, Omnar lenses. 
uh, super fancy, high cost, low production run custom lenses, predominantly for uh, Leicas. So that's basically everything that I don't do wrapped up in one small lens. But I know that I am in a minority there and there are a lot of Leica fans out there and a lot of people who prefer um, premium stuff over the cheap crap that I buy. But again, it's an innovative approach, it's a new idea and they're obviously popular, you know, he's shifted at that at his, his higher price point, he's shifted 25 lenses, you know, in a heartbeat. So uh, there's a market for it. And the more products we have on the market in the film photo industry, the more there is for people to choose from and uh, you know, the more people will be able to find something that suits them. So I will watch with interest to see what Hamish comes up with next, although I am not heading out to buy a Leica. Not today, not tomorrow. I'm going to say it, not ever. I think I'm, I'm, I'm safe. Last but not least, let's go and talk to Duncan from Silverpan Labs. And next up, uh, we've got Duncan from Silver Pan Film Labs. Hello, Duncan. Hi. How are you doing? I'm not too bad, thanks. Uh, who is Silver Pan Film Labs and what do you do? Um, well, we're a film processing and laboratory based in Bristol, although we um, service the whole of UK and Europe and abroad as well um, through Free Post. I think we're the only lab in the country that does every single process. So we're, we're like really quite bespoke. We do, you know, E6 processing, C41 processing, black and white in a, in a wide variety of developers that we offer. Um, we also do black and white slides and we do ECN2 cinema film as well, which is one of our like specialities. Uh, but so you do all those processes, yeah. um, mail order? Excuse mail me. order, free post send in. Yeah. And the other, the other thing we specialise in is we've got a, a, a Hasselblad flex tight scanner. So. Right. Um, we, we offer both Noritsu scans, which are like our standard scans, but still very high resolution. And then for something extra special, we do use the, the FlexTi X5, which is a, a semi-drum scanner. So it's like really ridiculously high res, huge file sizes and, and detail in there. Well, there are some cameras on your desk here. Uh, are you are you just, are you just doing second-hand cameras? Are you are you? Yeah, um, it's definitely not. Or? It's, it's not our main. It's not our main um, part do. of the business. It's, it's it's very nice to have in the window. Basically, that, brings people in. Is that your personal GA six four five? This is yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, that one's not for sale. Not yeah. for sale. Uh, where can we find you online? We are silverpan or one word dot co dot uk. Uh, I'm going to cut Duncan a bit short there. I'm not going to let him talk too much because I'm hopefully going to be going down to see Duncan in his lab to see how a kind of modern boutique film developing and scanning and printing uh, operation works. So that will be quite exciting. He's got some, some fancy kit down there and I expect I will learn a fair bit about some of those uh, other processes that I haven't got involved with yet. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of these exciting videos that are coming up. Uh, finally, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to the organisers of this event. It was a fascinating day, lots of fun, great to meet all these people that are instrumental in the film photography industry here in the UK. Really looking forward to the next one. All right, that's it for today. Thanks a lot. Bye.